I wanna just get into some of the the business aspects of of what you do, ne? like how you charge different people for for mixing and for and for mastering. Like, what are your what are your rates for for both? First of all, let me say thank you to DMS and everyone who's here for hosting me and Sir LSG for, <laughs> for asking me the questions and taking charge of the whole interview. Uh, how I work with mixing and mastering is different. Uh, there'll be someone giving me 10 tracks to master and there'll be someone giving me one song. So they, I've got discounts depending on how many songs they're giving me. But then if it's just one song, I charge anything from around... 450, 500 somewhere, so I'll say 500 because now my workload is up. So it just depends how busy I am because I also don't, don't just do those. I've got lots of things that I'm doing. And it also depends on the time frame. Someone will give me a song today and say I want my song to be ready tomorrow. So I charge me more for that and we call it express. So it means you, wanna, you want me to stop everything I'm doing and be mastering your song. So I charge you for that. So it depends. Someone will give me a song and say I want it next month. That one I can go very easy on them. Yeah. Cool. And um, do you do you master everything that you get? Uh, there, there are very few guys. I'll say maybe five percent of the guys who say no. We just want you to mix because maybe they hear like the song doesn't sound how they want it to sound. So just mix for me. I've got a friend of mine who can master because mastering for me is like the final stage where you just make sure that the song sounds as professional as possible. So the most difficult part is mixing, of which with myself, how I charge for mixing is, sorry, is uh, per separate. So it depends how big the project is. If you give me a project that's got 15 separates and someone comes and gives me a project that's got like 100 separates, I don't charge the same, I charge per separate, of which normally they are standard as mixing engineers is like 50 bucks per separate. So if your song has got 20 separates, that's like 1,000 rand, you know? And then if someone comes with a song that's got 100 separates, you know, <laughs> so it, de oh <laughs> it depends how big the project is. Yeah. And it's also going to chow like lots of time. Mixing for me, I always ask someone to give me a song and I'll mix it for roughly two weeks, of which is not every day I'm focused on that song. One, I'll spend maybe one hour mixing this today, take a break, do something else. The next day, basically now you're like, you keep him in, in, in the studio. So that's why mixing is a little bit more, I would say, expensive for for engineers and for people who make music. Cool. Um, I think let's get into what you are here to show us, and then we'll take questions at the end. Okay. For now, I'm just gonna. I, yeah, I can use it. I'll focus more on on the kick. I think most most guys get the kick and bass wrong because they are all playing towards the low frequencies, of which my trick, what I do when I mix, uh, I always kill the, um, okay. I kill my, my, my 40 kilohertz, especially on the, on the bass line, so that it doesn't clash with the kick. And also there's something that we call side chaining, of which it also gives the, uh, the kick a chance to punch, because the kick is, it's not called a kick for, by mistake, it's a kick because it must be the whole drive of the song. So we let the kick breathe. So let me check this project. Uh, and on this project, this this project basically, <laughs> I've done this project with John London, and we've got Wanda on vocals, but then there's no vocals. Just sorry, Wanda, it took you <laughs> off for now. So on this project, there's a sample. If, if you listen, so on this sample, let me show you. This is a sample, if you listen to it. We killed a lot of frequencies out of this sample. So it plays like, it's just that Litswa on top, it's, but it works magic. If you listen to it, uh, here is my EQ here. The great, the great part is where I killed all the, 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 the frequencies. If I disable this, this is completely a different thing. You hear? There's more noise. But when it's like this, it's, it gives the whole song the chance to breathe. So when it goes with the whole song, it's something that goes like...
So you can hear that the, the sample is actually giving the whole song a, uh, a different feel. You ask yourself, you're like, okay, what's going on with this song? I like just having this song without this, if it's gonna be something like this. It was quite boring. But with this, so it's a small thing, but it makes a huge difference. So when it comes to cutting frequencies, it depends on uh, what kind of sound I want from each each sound. Like let me check, let me check this. Remove. Oh. That's the kick. If you listen to the kick, it's got a little bit of detail. Normally when I mix, I'll come to this kick and kill some frequencies. Let me go to the uh, EQ. So here, if you listen to this kick, if I do this, it sounds different. So it depends on what, what I want to do with the song. Some songs we choose to automate uh, in, in order to, like I can start the song, it will be playing like this, and then as it comes, if, when I want the kick and then, and then I can cut it wherever I want to cut it. But most, mostly with myself, what I do, I normally cut towards 40 hertz. And then if there's a bass line, uh, my bass line is somewhere here. It's here. It's this one. So with a bass line like this, I also cut it on 40 kilohertz to give it a little bit of breathing. So when they play together, if you check them, there's this, there, there. With this. So if you listen to the, normally uh, we, we work with frequencies. If you listen to a bass beat, normally it carries the lows. So if the if I want the song to have that dramatic bass line. Like, well, let, me, let me talk about uh, this sound particularly. It's got a lot of detail. Uh, let me go to it, especially uh, here. I can, choose to I can choose to kill the detail here, but then Now it's just sub only. If you listen to the speaker, you'll hardly hear anything. But if you listen to the sub hoover, you'll hear the, the, the punch and the, the bass coming in. So with, with some songs, normally I always choose to give the bass line a little bit of, of drama, you know? Because you don't want to sound the same like with any others. Every, everyone uses a sub bass. So for you to hear what this, the difference between the bass lines, you give it a detail of which is this, what I normally do. So with mixing, Mixing the bass and the, the kick, I normally do it using uh, frequencies and compression. Like someone will be playing a live bass and it's not, the volume is not uh, uniform. So with compressor, compressor what it does, it, it closes the bass line not to pass set a certain velocity or a certain volume. So with the bass line, if someone has been playing a live bass, there are some, 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 some even slap it. When you slap it, it gives you just that little detail. So with compression, you still slap your bass, you play di at different velocities, but then with compressor, I try to keep it so it can play uniform, so that the DJ doesn't have to always lower the volume and, or increase or something like that. Another thing that matters to me the most is, uh, let me check it, is the, is the keys. When it comes to keys, uh, when, when I do mixing, uh, I know there's something called uh, imaging. Like if you play a keyboard, it's, it's got an image. So when I image, I, I normally just do it stereo. There's something called stereo and mono, I believe everyone knows. So with a so, sounds like keyboard, it always has to be in stereo because it, it's what gives the song a, an image. Whereas a kick, a kick normally, if it's mono, it's cool. You don't have to pen a kick. A kick must always just be punching directly f like one, one, it's just a straight line. It just has to punch on the lows. It doesn't have to be, to have an image. But with sounds like keys, if you listen to this keys here, there's something called tremolo. 
people who play keyboard know it. Listen to this, yeah. It just gives the song the image of which. Okay, the keys, I think. Let's see. Can you hear that? The reason normally it does that, if the sound connection is maybe plugged in stereo, this sound is not gonna be bouncing. It's gonna be basically moving from one speaker to the other. You understand? Of which is one detail that most people miss. You find someone playing keys and it's on mono and every, every sound just comes directly from one place, which, which is what causes normally what we call distortion. You find a song distorting, but then the volume is not high. Other songs are loud, no distortion, but other songs are soft, but there's distortion. It's because of something called imaging. When you image yourself properly, it's basically, if you look at the speaker, the speaker is, depending on how many inches it is, it's got lines. You see lines on the speaker as it goes, like circles. LSG's album. <laughs> so those circles, on each, under, underneath each circle, there's a frequency that sits there. So when you image and equalize a song, you, it's basically placing each element on a, on a particular line. Let me see if the speaker has. Yeah, it does. So when you image the song properly, it means that all the, those uh, lines, on each line, the volume is gonna be at exactly the same level. Or maybe people would do, there's some, some genre that they used to call drum and bass. You remember it? <laughs> what they used to focus on more than anything, they were focused on the, on the sub hoover and the snares, of which the snares, they'll put different kind of snares, of which they, maybe they'll use maybe three, kind, three sounds, each snare on a different, different frequency of which just gives that song loudness and at the same time, it sounds clean, it sounds clean. But if you don't do it properly, you find your song just not loud, but then distorting the speaker. Next thing you have to be on the mix as a DJ, having to adjust each frequency, doing your own, your, your own mixing on the, on the mixer, of which is, I believe it's not right for people who've done sound engineering, they know when you play on the mixer, each song, they prefer for you to be just a straight line of which is on flat zero. So for a song to say it's final and it sounds good, it has to be on, on flat zero, it must sound as, as any other professional song. If you have, you have your songs on zeros, you play this one and you play the other one, but you hear difference, chances are the one that's low is the one that's not uh, mastered. Or another one, you find that it's, it sounds loud, but then you, you find that the kick is, is weak, of which is now, that's, that's when I would do a lot of equalizing and sound selection, because also, as much as mastering and mixing is important, also the recording process is as, as important. You can use the, if you don't use the right microphone, and there's some errors and distortion when you record, there's nothing that the mixing engineer can, can fix from that. There are some errors that a mastering engineer, ca I mean a, a mixing engineer can't fix. That's why every time there are tricks to learn how to record, you need to, to know your level. Uh, some people, even lately, they use compressors. Also, a choice of your, your, your microphone matters so much, so you need to know what kind of sounds you wanna record. Also, another thing that people ignore, it's acoustics. With myself, I made sure that I, I, I've got nice acoustics. When you enter my room, it's, it's really dead. When you speak any, any word or any tone, it dies, it doesn't get any way it dies. So with a room that where you're doing mixing and mastering, normally, a room matters so much, I would say uh, 50%. If the room is not right, actually I would even say 70, if the room is not right, you can't mix. And you won't master, because you'll be hearing your bass, your bass lines moving all over, all over the, the room. So you won't know if the bass is too much or it's low. That's why sometimes you get a song that in the studio, it's banging, and then you get out there. When you play it, it's like, what happened to my song? Bang loy, you know? And there's no witchcraft, it's just a matter of not having the right room. Sure. Um, let's talk about plugins, um, yeah. um, because somebody on Monday, on, on Wednesday, was asking about plugins. Yeah. Um, what sort of plugins do you do you use for your mixing? Uh, you, waves. I think waves is still number one. Uh, and also, there's different people use different. With waves, what I like about waves is waves. You can use it on almost every door. So if you've got Cubase, you've got Fruity Loops, of which I know most people use Fruity Loops. 
uh, you can still buy and install waves and use it. Also, there's uh, Isotope. Yeah, Isotope is also a good uh, quality plugin for those. Yeah, and um, is it advisable to, would you advise people to buy their plugins? I mean, obviously there's other means yeah. of getting plugins. <laughs> <laughs> yes, obviously I would advise, because even those, as much as you, you don't want your music to be pirated, then... <laughs> <laughs> don't pirate the software also because those people are also creatives and they do those, most of them they do it for a living so if you want to do things right, start from, from the beginning when we were learning I know we, we did a lot of pirating also obviously because we can't afford but when you start seeing that you're, you're making a bit of something, it's always good to go and buy because when you buy you also get something like a license, you get updates so you find, you find that you've got a little bit of more, more advantage I like someone who, who just pirated it. Yeah, and also I think another thing with regards to buying plugins um, a, a pro yeah. um, is that when, if your machine dies um, or you need to move to another machine, um, you know, now you have to, if you are pirating your, your plugins, now you need to find new pirates, you know, like, and so when you've bought something, even when your machine dies and you move on to another machine, because you've got the license, just becomes an, an easy plug and go, you know. Um, so I would advise people to save up a bit and get good plugins. Um, you don't have to buy everything, you know. Buy what you need first. And also you get support. If there's an error with the software, you can easily get support. Yes. They'll actually give you attention. Exactly. And you don't want to have a, a situation where a singer is coming or you've got a musician coming to your studio to collaborate. Next it thing, crashes. your your thing is crashing. There, yeah. it's not working. You know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Um, but I think let's get some questions specifically with regards to studio plugins um, and anything like that, mixing and mastering quality stuff. Um, Jazzy, let's get some. One, two, 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 two. One. Cool. Okay. Show my brother. Hola. Sharp. Sure. Yeah. I actually just want to find out your EQ technique. Uh, you, you, you prefer, uh, do you prefer additive or, or, or maybe subtractive or a bit of both? It's a bit of both. But then additive is way better for me, preferably. Oh. Okay. Because I actually saw uh, like the examples that you show uh, when you're actually uh, doing a high pass uh, on, a, on a kick and a bass. So I didn't see that little bump that you do like at the end of, of uh, or actually where your cut uh, uh, begins. Where the, the link, you didn't see that? The, normally people will, will, will do a little bump, you know, like bump it up, where, where actually your curves start going down. It depends what, what you want to achieve with sound. Uh, normally I always say sound has no rules. That's why you, uh, you'll find someone who's got a song that sounds like, some say crap, but then it will still be interesting to everyone. So you have to be, for me, it's very, you have to be very creative. If you do it too much by the book and read and put yourself in a box, you end up just, you know, you must be creative. What I do normally, I just become creative. When I jump on a mix, I don't have, I don't have rules. I listen to a song and I'm like, okay, this song would sound nice if this certain element will dominate. Like, especially when it comes to, when I normally work on some, there are some artists that when I mix for, I know. A snare is, is their key, their key thing. The, the snare literally, jumps out of the mix, but with, with compression, that's where I'm gonna control it, but the snare always rules, and there are those that I know that, okay, like let me say black motion, I know it's normally the toms, and like you have to know your artists also, as you work with them, you get to, to build, you, kn you know their sound. Okay, yeah. well, uh, one more question, and then uh, when you actually approach a mix, yeah. do you prefer to, to work with passes, uh, like, like for example, you're dealing okay. with drums, yeah. You're working with a bass, or do you work with individual instruments? With, with drums, I, I don't work with bass because I want each element to sound different. So with vocals, let's say baking vocals, those are the ones that I put on a bass normally. Yeah, thanks. Cool. We'll come to you. Uh, good day, everyone. Hola. Uh, my question is related to mastering. Yeah, mastering. Yeah. I just want to ask, uh, how do you uh, ensure about the, the loudness like that your song is similar to the others? 
like normally the songs that you listen to, how do you ensure that it's similar in loudness to the yeah. other tracks? Yeah. Uh, normally, as much as we also do referencing, we also check, uh, normally it depends what kind of equipment you use. Normally I've got a mixer that I use there that's got lights. Uh, spectrum, it tells you the spectrum, it tells you the loudness, you just know that you don't need to, you don't want to clip. So already I know if this certain lights go on, on that equipment, it means that the song is at its loudest. If I push beyond that, it's, it's distortion, yeah. So you, you must have a monitoring tool in a way. Normally I saw Martinet Jazz has got this equipment that's got a lot of lights right in front of him. So those lights tell you basically the loudness of the song. Cool. Um, let's get one there. Um, hi. So I just wanted to find out, say that you do a song, you mix and master yourself, right? Assuming that you're unable to get like a mixing engineer or you just believe that you're able to master yourself. Um, which, like at which places are best for you to test the quality of the song and its loudness? Like, is it in a car? Is it in an event? Is it like, which, which places would you recommend for one to be able to gauge whether or not where they need to improve if they aren't able to reach a level where they're able to pay for a mixing and mastering engineer? Uh, that's, that, that's just gonna take you more time because normally if you do, you do that yourself, of which is not advisable at all, I think you would produce a song and probably take a break from that song for maybe some weeks. Try to mix it, also take breaks like a lot. It will take a long time for you to, to be very, what, what, what is it called? Like, hear it differently. Yeah, kind of be objective. Be objective, like, yeah. Because if you work on it today and then tomorrow you want to mix and the other, no, it, chances are there's going to be lots of errors. Cause also mastering, the big thing about mastering, as much as it's, it's, it's the, that final tweaking, also it's to get a second opinion from someone that you trust. Because you can, even when you give someone to work on your song, you must have heard their work and then you trust them like, I know, whatever this guy, whatever song that this guy touches is gonna sound good. So it's basically just getting a sub second uh, opinion. Yeah, so I think uh, also it depends what kind of equipment you have. Maybe let's say monitors. There are monitors that you can use for, for mixing, for, for instance. Or if you mix with those, they light, they light you because they're not meant for mixing. They are maybe meant for just referencing or just recording. So you have to also just check on the internet. There are monitors that they'll tell you, okay, this is the number one monitor for mastering release, really this one. Because it's not gonna, mixing and mastering, you don't wanna hear lies. You wanna hear exactly what people are gonna hear everywhere. And when it comes to referencing a song after you've done the whole work, it's everywhere. You can listen with your head, head, headphones in your car. Every, every, you can play it almost everywhere you go so you can hear if it still sounds good. Because uh, the initial uh, purpose of mastering is to make sure the song, the song sounds good on every equipment, on every speaker. So wherever. Played as uh, on as many speakers and equipment as possible. Yeah, yeah. and um, also just in addition, like sometimes it's very difficult when you're doing things on your own, and even when you're refer referencing with another song. So you're listening to a well-mastered song, and you're thinking, "Why is my song not sounding as good as this?" You know, you might not know exactly what this person did. You know, um, you might not have the experience yet. So I, I would really advise people to, yes, learn how to do it yourself, yeah. but also learn from other people who, who've done it professionally, you know, um, and invest a bit of money as well. I think if you take your song, for example, to Chima or anyone who is a mixing or master engineer, you can also ask them, what did you do to this kick? What did you do on the song? You know, so you, you're not only paying to get the product, but you're also getting some kind of knowledge, you know, yeah. Um, one more, um, this side. Sure. Hi. Yeah, um, you basically answered the first question I wanted to ask. Um, I was going to ask about, you know, the mastering engineer and, yeah. you know, being subjective, obviously, in regards to the music you get. Um, in terms of mixing, uh, what would you say is the biggest problem that you get in terms of you know people sending you through um, a song to mix, uh, whether it's compression, equalization, that sort of thing. What have you picked up that you know most people do wrong before you even have a chance to to start mixing for them? Uh, it's uh, it's called bleeding. You'll be recording vocals. Next thing you hear the beat on the 
on the vocals. That's that's a, one of the biggest problems because when I'm listening to the vocals, I'm not like be hearing that 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 yeah. The chick -chick -chick going. So it's normally to avoid that, just you need to buy um, headphones. They're called a closed back, so the the sound doesn't get out of the, the the back of the headphone to the microphone. So besides bleeding, also is distortion, and also just having chickens or kids making noise in the background, of which you say I've got like, it's some some stuff that's that really you can't clean up even when you mix. It's like bro. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how's it, uh, Chaima? I wanted to ask something. Uh, let's say for one, if one would get treatment for their studio, like the whole acoustic treatment and everything, would you be able to get the same quality when mixing like you would be using your analog devices, hardware? Would it uh, somehow at least get it the best effort, like maybe a mixing that would be done by someone like Preacher. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, Preacher, I know he's doing out of the box. Uh, normally with the, the out of the, it gives you a, a whole different sound of which, but then if you spend more time and you, you learn your, 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 your game and you've got the right room and the right, you can, get, you can achieve. But then the thing about analog is it had, for it to distort, like it, you, normally guys who do analog, their songs are a little bit louder, but then you can achieve that. Clean, cleanliness you can achieve. You, ach you achieve cleanliness from production. Like people who know how to slightly mix and master their production, like the guys who send me their, their, their projects, already when I, when I load it on the software, it already sounds right. Because when you produce, you must also be thinking of the end product. And there are those who send you separates and then you have to make sense out of them. Like, yo, this kick sounds like a hi-hat and a, a snare at the same time. And then I have to try make sense of which some people like normally when I work with guys who used to auto-tune, Boki Monata, I always tell him to auto-tune his things and put his reverb so I don't change his sound. So in a way, that how you give me the files, you must, you must put that in mind that however you give me the files, there are things that I, I might not be able to change and there are things that I might not be able to, to do. Will it, will it make it easier if, from a production perspective, if you would be using uh, better sounds? Would it make it yeah. yes. Better sound, yeah. Also, selection of sounds. There are some plugins that you know. It's if either the plugin is only 50 megabytes, you can't expect quality sound from 50 megabytes. And there's like Omnisphere's where it's like 40 gigs, 40 gigs, just one plugin. Like, there's your a lot of them battery, what what they are very big and their, their quality is it's obviously better than what you get from your 10 megabytes uh, plugin. So, you must just res re research your plugins a little bit and see which ones are the high end. Yeah, we've got one more on this side. I think we need... Uh, here's one here. Hello, hi Chama. Um, I just want to ask you, man. There's two two things on on production. I'm fairly new on production, but there's um well, uh, a kick okay. and a bass. Yeah. Those two guys, they always argue. Yeah. Um, when you make music. Yeah. So I just want to know because um I've recently found out about side chaining. Okay. Which uh, I've done few tracks and it did some magic. Um, on your side, how do you separate so that when the kick hits and the bass respect the kick? Because sometimes, because they, I think they're on, they're on the same. Uh, what do they call? Frequency. Okay. Um, so I just want to know, on your side, how do you make sure that the kick hits at the, at the right time, or even if they hit at the same time, but they, they don't compete? That's, that's where we, we use uh, side chaining and also cutting off some frequencies. Let's say if, depends if the song you want, you must choose, on every song you must choose what must dominate. Normally, even the, the saying goes, you can't have two men in the same house and bo both of them, they are bosses. You must choose which one is the boss on that particular song. Like I'll, I'll say on a song like, how many songs have, 
There's a song, let me give an example with uh, guys who use lock drum. If you listen to their songs, that they are playing in the car, next thing as it plays, when that bass comes and then the, the whole, the car just closes the whole volume, it's because the whole song is fighting. So it's, when you, when you, even with lock drum, there, there are songs that I've, 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 I've mixed, Jadi piano, but then they sound, they sound good because that's where now we compress. You compress, you choose where you place in the, 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 the bass and where you place in the kick. Normally with I'm a piano, there's no kick. It's basically just uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> there's that sound that just pushes the. It's not, it's not a kick because it doesn't kick. It just pushes the the sub like it's like air. <laughs> but that's how they do it. And then the what the the magic about it, the lock drum is the one that kicks. So it comes and it kicks on ar around 40, 40 hertz and 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 thirty. Normally there are numbers. You must know where the. But normally with those guys, the, the, the kick is not there. It's not there. It's like literally at the end. Yeah. Well, so with w besides besides side chaining and also um, frequency, like you need to give each sound its own frequency. If they, they fight, obviously when the other one comes in, because if you look at the speaker, when, when when it plays, when it kicks, it goes it goes forward. So imagine if it's forward and then there's something kicking while it's for it's something is already kicking it to be forward. Like it's if you look at it with, with your eyes, you must place your bass when now the speaker is back. When it goes back, kick. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to play nicely. But if they are fighting, the other one is front and the other one is the one to... Imagine you are, you, are pushed, you are pushed next to this thing and then someone is still pushing you. Basically, it's as much as doing nothing. Next thing, the whole song just won't make sense. The speaker won't get, get a space to breathe. <laughs> Cool. Uh, Jackie. Hi. Um, so I have a very rudimentary question about mix downs. So I release music um, on my label and when producers send me stuff to send to someone like yourself, um, there's sometimes you obviously have to worry about things like levels and you know, so you get, try and get it to one person who will master it for you. So I just wanted to find out from you what are the sort of key things that you need as a mastering engineer. So if I'm sending you a mix down, what are some of the things that, that you need to be able to, to do your job as well as you do? Because I know people say, yeah. my next 6 dB and yeah. all of that. So just please explain to me what, what, what are some of the, the key things that you need to, to do a master from a mix down? Yeah, when you send a mix down, it must be 24 bit, of which is more like lossless uh, wave or A double I F, and also it must be it must pick at minus six decibels. But there are, there are guys who, who bring stuff to me, which uh, as long as it doesn't clip for me, I don't mind. But we prefer minus six because it gives me a headroom. I know how to. There are some errors that I can fix. Like the lower it sounds, the the more errors I can fix. But if it's already hitting already on like your one decibels, already there's many errors that are not correctable. So it's a 24 bit wave. Uh, minus six decibels, preferably. Yeah, so you don't send a 16, uh, 16 bit wave for mastering. Normally, you, you already lost some, some detail of the song. Or MP3. Or MP3. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, thanks, you have answered the first one, Jackie, that uh, uh, she has asked. Uh, the second question is that uh, do you do parallel compression? Is it compulsory? And then do you do it to all the instruments? Uh, no, I don't do it to all instruments. There are some instruments that don't need uh, compression at all. Like, let me talk about something like what, normally when I compress, I compress your, your keys and your, like the sounds, there are sounds that need to be sharp. Let me say it's something like a snare or a high hats. Normally on the high, all the sounds that are hitting towards the highs, let them breathe. Because they are the life of the song. That's why normally when you go to, 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 to some uh, plugins, you find something called Exciter. You're trying to, to resurrect the song. Just like when the, 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 the speaker has no Twitter, you hear that it, it's a song, but it sounds there. So with that, those highs, it's, it's what gives the song, the song life. You can compress anything that's below, I'll say, a, a thousand, thousand hertz, whether we call it normally presence. You can compress anything that plays be, below that, but above that, let it breathe. That's what I do. Cool.
Uh, do we have any more questions? Let's take one or two. Cool. Hi, Ellis. Hola. Show Chima. Hola. DJ Marvin M here. I'm a resident DJ at uh, SMU FM. Yeah, your, your staff does play there. So most of the guys, the quality that I hear from Backroom Studios, it's a disaster. <laughs> It's a disaster, you know. So I want to know, like, what are the basic requirements when one submits a, to an engineer like you? Like, what is it that you want to receive from this, you know, raw material that's coming out of gas? Yeah, I'll say the same uh, question as Jackie asked. is 24-bit waves. But also another thing that people do, the samples that you use to make your music also matter. You can take an MP3 sample and then you you convert it to wave, it's wrong. You don't do that. You can't convert up, you convert down. So if you're using a sample that's, that's an MP3, even if you send me a wave already, that it's like it's been in an accident, and then now you fixed it, you painted it. When, but when you drive it, you can still hear. You can still feel that, ah, man. You know? So it's always best to have the, the, the highest quality of, of everything that you use for production before you send it. If you send me a 24-bit, uh, mixed down. Already you must have used 24-bit samples to do that. Or, yeah. Morning, good morning. Uh, uh, yeah. Could you please uh, give us um, uh, guidelines of some sort, like uh, when, with regards to um, frequencies, maybe the k code it needs to range from 15 and the bass maybe from 35 to Maybe 60, for example. Could you please just give us some sort of template mm. nyana or guidelines and duty? My template would be normally I don't let the bass dominate more than the kick, of which uh, I would say my kick still around 40 kilohertz. That's why I keep my, my kick. The little detail of uh, sub, I, I can edit somehow, but then my kick is always the one that kicks around 40 kilohertz. And then something like a bass line, just slightly up, you know, around 60, that's why I give it detail. Like if you listen to a bass line that I've done for Speak Lot, if, if I switch off a kick there, literally you don't, the, you don't hear too much bass, you hear a little bit of organ. So me, myself, I always just choose to, to let the kick dominate the, let the kick do the kicking, you know, don't fight with it. Yeah, but I think with other stuff, you can, you can literally go online and say yeah. frequency spectrum for different instruments will get charts that will yeah. say a snare is supposed to be living around these frequencies, high heads and so forth, you know. But yet another trick is to be creative. Because you, if, you're, if you're creative, sometimes, like I said, don't always try to read from the book and otherwise you're just going to sound like everyone else. Go out there, do something that's crazy that people like. Listen to rock music. You know those guys, they distort everything. That guitar, they, it's distortion. But you see them going crazy. Imagine if they were playing it like an acoustic. It won't, they won't be rock. Cool. Um, we're going to take the last two questions, Kara, my brother, ne? and uh, one here. Hello. Uh, Chama, when you are referencing, when you AP your, your, your song, ne? do you AP in a form of MP3 or in a waveform? I reference with MP3. It's fine. For MP3? Yeah, it doesn't really matter because MP3, it must just be the, a higher quality, 320 kbps. So it doesn't, you don't lose much, much detail. Cool. And one more here, Jersey. Okay, we're gonna take the last two. Sure. Sure. Uh, sure, Chima. Sure. I don't know if I understood you correctly. Did you say when you're producing, you mustn't use a, a, like a, a sample or something from a sound pack that is an MP3 format? You can use it, but then don't blame the quality later on. So it's just to retain quality. If you, if you want to put something out that's going to sound at the best, at the peak best, have use the best and highest quality samples. OK. Yeah. But uh, the sound packs usually that we get or, or buy online, are they not MP3? They're waves. Oh, they're waves. Oh, the yeah. ones that you buy. Oh, if, yeah. you pirate, if, buy. You, if you pirate, you get <laughs> MP3s. But if you buy, they'll give you waves. Now we know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just one last question. Can you...
Chama, how are you, my brother? I'm good. How are you, my brother? Yeah, I'm well. Uh, sure. I'm hearing only questions about frequency mastering. Uh, the previous guests we uh, Lesoko asked uh, about even deep stuff, not only about mastering things like that. So what I want to know, like. Uh, we know you have a, a banger remix called Speak Lord. What was going through your mind like when you received uh, that vocal? Like when, when Willie told you to, to, to make a remix, what was going through your mind? And what's, like, what, what is it that driven you to make that a banger? That banger? Yo, with music, the thing is, it's, with music, what I realized is it's like a. It's like a call him, I mean, like this. With, with Willie, that song, Speak Lord, the original one, I'm the one who mixed and mastered it. So I had that song, I think, last, the other year. So I just had it in my file. So when he said I must remix, basically he just said, you remember the song that you mixed? Take that and see what, what you can do out of it. I want, I want to release the remix package. But I, I didn't struggle to do anything there. Literally, I remember the whole idea was, I went to church, came back. <laughs> It, it took me like three hours to, to do that remix. You won't believe it. Yeah, yeah, it oh. took me three hours. I, I even have a video that I recorded. On the same day when I was remixing, I took a video. I was wearing my church uniform, just playing around. And then that's how it came about from there. Done. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, we thank you. So, uh, since well, that song inspired you, should we expect more from you, especially? Uh, gospel, some gospel house music from me. <laughs> it depends, my man. Me, uh, nah, cause fortunately, I'm, I'm not. I'll say, yeah, I'm not signed to any label, so I do music with, with at my at my own pace. So it depends how I feel. Uh, but I think I don't, I don't rush to do lots of music and release and release. Like this year, if I check alone, I, I think I released maybe about less than less than less than ten songs really, or less than even six songs. Mostly it was the remix. I, it was remixes by other people, but I don't release. I don't release a lot of music. But I think next year, cause I might, I might be releasing some music, so you might expect. Yeah, I've got songs that I've done with Boanda, Bomonik Binghams that I've just they're just locked. I don't even play them myself. I'm like, okay, I'll see maybe next year. Now it's COVID. You, if you release anything now, really, it's, yeah, it's, I feel like for me, it's, it don't make sense. People are busy wearing masks and. <laughs> Looking at the statistics, they don't have time to be, yeah, so less is more. Cool. Um, let's give a round of applause to Chaima.